a retired Danish chef with no prior knowledge about undercover operations, heads a secret mission into North Korea to expose the reclusive regime's efforts to evade international sanctions. And his findings are shared in the documentary, The Mall, Undercover in North Korea. Welcome to Issues and Insiders. Today we hear the confessions of a former Danish chef who spent years seeking to expose North Korea's illicit efforts to evade sanctions. For more on this, I have Ulrich Larsen here in the studio with me. Ulrich, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for letting me come today. Right now, before we delve into details about your undercover activities in North Korea, let's begin with a few words about the purpose behind your latest visit to South Korea. Yeah, I was invited uh, for the third time to uh, a movie festival putting focus on human rights in North Korea. And I'm very honored being here and have been to five cities around South Korea this time. It's, it's just amazing and how nice people are to, to me and how fascinated they are about the documentary. And it's, um, well, and that just makes me think that human rights in North Korea ne really need more focus because it's really bad. Up right, north of course. Now. Yeah. And before we delve into your documentary then, let's start off perhaps with a few words about what initially triggered your interest in North Korea. Well, it's a long story. <laughs> um, when I was a kid, I grew up in the southern part of Denmark. And at that time, uh, we still got the Cold War going on, a separated Germany. My uh, father works on the ferries who sails from Denmark to Germany, and we both got routes to, to the east and the west. And Traveling with my father for work, um, sometimes I saw both sides um, and also the socialist communist regime in East Germany, and that frightened me. Um, luckily enough, uh, we got a reunification in Germany, and Europe was liberated from, yeah, let's just call them dictators, as it was before '89. And well, then I grew up, and Mas Boyga, the director of the Mole, had done uh, another documentary about North Korea named The Red Chapel, where he travels to North Korea on the purpose of doing some cultural exchange. So they wanted to do a theater show on the national stage in Pyongyang. And they did such a, a little screening before, uh, and the North Korean didn't like it because it got a lot to do with the independence. So they literally torn this apart. And it was so bizarre. Um, one of the actors, Jacob Nossel, who is a spastic, um, and you don't see handicapped people, disabled people in North Korea. So the director got the vice idea that Jacob could play a normal person being handicapped, which doesn't make sense. So bizarre it was. That caught my attention about North Korea also because it reminds me a bit of Germany. They were separated because of a war. You got the socialists on one side and you got the capitals on the other side. So it didn't really show the smoking gun, the Red Chapel. So I thought maybe I could find the smoking gun showing how evil and bizarre North Korea is. Right. So I proposed Mas Boyga, and luckily enough he, he returned to me and we had a few conversations and 10 years later we got them all. Right, I see. And, and before we talk about that then, I understand initially though you joined the local branch of the Korean Friendship Association in order to get access into North Korea. Could you tell us a bit about this association? Well, there is two stories in that. Um, my first way in was to a Danish Friendship Association, which is elderly people, um, really old communist, age 60, uh, like to travel around and think that North Korea is heaven on earth. That's what they tell people. Uh, of course, that's a big lie. They're lying for themselves. But that was my way into the little, little Danish Association, which brought me to North Korea in the first time. Being in North Korea, I was awarded with a medal of the regime because I have been doing small documentaries about the Danish Association's work to praise North Korea. And, and when I got that medal, I met the president and founder of KFA, Alejandro Caude Benos, which claims that his association is to bring in peace and knowledge and freedom in North Korea. But we proved through the way that it's more like a scam for him to do criminal activities to support North Korea. I see. So your first trip into North Korea took place in 2000 and 12, is it? Yeah. And for then you were in the country just to, on the pretext of visiting it. Yeah, first. and celebrating the birthday of Kim Il-sung. He was got the 100 years anniversary in the period we were there. I see. And you were awarded a medal for that. Yeah. And then afterwards you met up with Alejandro Cao de Benos, who is the president of the Korean Friendship Association based in Spain. Spain, then. yes. I see. Could you tell us a bit more about this man? Well, 
he's a manipulating man. He he likes to say he's got thousands of members of KFA, but I literally think the real numbers today could be less than 500, maybe 200. Um, but he's very good at finding people who come from lower society, unemployed young people that suffering in Spain because of financial issues. And I think the way he can persuade him is say, hey, look at North Korea. You got a job, you got school, you got a house, you have everything. What do you have in Spain? According to Holland, nothing. You need to fight for your way of living to earn money. And, and some of those people believe in him. Um, and as soon as you cross the line of him, he just kick you out. But to be quite frankly, my personal opinion about Alejandro is that he's a psychopath and a narcissist. How were you able to gain his trust then? He came to me. Because you got this medal, medal he saw from me North in Korea. Korea. Yeah. So he asked me to reach out to him when we were back in Europe. And then I agreed on meeting him up in Barcelona, Spain. And he then asked me if I wanted to be his um, KFA man, official, he, he pronounced it official delegate in Denmark, which means that I could contact the press on behalf of North Korea. I could be asked from the North Korean embassy in Stockholm that covers all of Scandinavia to check out if journalists seek visa for, for North Korea. And there were actually people seeking visa, but I had to, to be honest today that I refused them to go because I wouldn't be the one accepting them to go to North Korea if they did a mistake and get caught in the system there. So, but that was a kind of, and, and he is probably the most dangerous Western man in North, he, no, he is the most dangerous Western man in North Korea. Right, and at this current point, as we speak, the FBI has issued an arrest warrant for yeah. Alejandro, of course. In the meantime, where, when, at what particular point do you get in touch with uh, Mads Brugger, whom you mentioned earlier, who is, of course, the director of the first documentary, The Red Chapel? When is it that you reach out to him? Uh, end of 2009. So this is be prior to your encounter with Alejandro? Yeah. yeah, it's three years before I met Alejandro. I start to type maths on, yeah, then, even, that was even on Facebook, so, and I never expected him to reply, but. But he did. But he did, so thanks for that. I see. And then, so your actual infiltration into North Korea to expose its illicit efforts to evade sanctions takes place after your encounter with Alejandro Caudebenos, yeah. right? Could you tell us a bit more about this mission that you held? And of course, the hiring of a Mr. James, is it, to play yeah. the role of an arms dealer? Please tell us a bit more about the actual mission. Well, first of all, my mission was actually, because I didn't know what to expect, I never done any kind of TV or movies before, so my first mind was to expose this Danish little association as a kind of uh, spooky, funny people praising Kim Jong-un and the, at that time Kim Jong-il and the regime. Um, and meeting up with those guys were like, OK, this can be funny. And, but I also was aware of this can't be anything that anyone likes to see. But then Alejandro came on and he asked for investors. And then we came to a point where, okay, let's see what he can offer because he hadn't told anything. He just wanted me to find investors. And uh, when I then had to go to Norway where we arranged a meeting with Alejandro and an uh, investor, uh, we need to find someone who, who know the games as a criminal. So that is where Mr. James comes in. His real name is Jim Quartrop Latras. He's a former uh, cocaine jet set pusher in, in Denmark. He spent eight years in prison. Um, and now has a whole legit business today and living a normal life. Um, but he was perfect for that role because he was the, the man with the big arms and laughing and stuff. And I was the more calm guy, you know, to get a mess tricking the, the puppets, so to speak. So he was hired as the man who would play the role of a potential investor in North Korea. Yes. And then you, moved, you went into North Korea to put this plan into actual action. Yeah. Now, I understand that parts of the documentary, Ulrich, were actually filmed using cameras that were hidden on you. Well, uh, not, were you not, not exactly on me, um, because I was well aware of if I had any s hidden items, they will pay their attention. So what I did was actually just turning on the camera, leaving it on a table. So it was secretly filmed, but they didn't was aware of. I put up the red light that showed it was on, and I put the things in, and just left the camera. Were you not ever worried about being exposed? Of course, going to North Korea and doing things that we did it could it will get you killed in North Korea for sure. Um, as 
one, one thing that's always comes to my mind when you talk about the fear and the consequences is um, Otto Warmbier, American student, who was accused of stealing a poster. Um, it's it's uh, so awful and really showing off how brutal the North Korean regime is. And for his family to have that loss, that touched me emotional every day. Right, of course. It was a very, very sad story. Yeah. Ulrich, with regard to your encounter in North Korea, could you tell us a bit about the people that you met there? Well, the first time in 2012, I was literally not able to have any kind of communication except the guides from the one that was traveling around with us. If I tried to interfere, they would look through me. If I had the chance to speak through a guide that translated, I'm not sure he asked the question that I was asking because everything that came back was that we are happy to be here because our leader loves us and he does everything for us. We've got a fantastic life. But I didn't see any smile. I, I only see neutral faces. The second time, um, it was a bit more easy because I had the medals, I got the badge, I could, I was, I was even offered a North Korean citizenship. Uh, I refused that, uh, <laughs> luckily enough. Um, but that made me a bit closer to the people. Um, but still, they are very frightened to talk with a person like me because I'm Western looking. I could be, they like to use the word CIA, FBI all the time about foreign people. Uh, but one thing that comes to my mind is the first time we were having the big guided tour around all of North Korea. And on the street, I saw people literally picking up grass or whatever, just to maybe have some dinner. And if I was asked, what are those people doing here? The answer was, they're just making it looking nice. And, and I think everybody would think that is not the truth. Right, of course not. So very, 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 very sad. Right. And with regard to your actual mission, could you tell us a bit more about your interactions with the North Koreans with regard to this uh, fake, of course, arms deal that you were trying to set up? Well, they, they came to us with all the options. And we were very aware of not to push them to, that we want to push them to give us. And so everything is arranged by Alejandro before we came. But and where are these meetings taking place? Inside Pyongyang? In Pyongyang, yeah. And the meeting where we were thrown over the, all the papers and documentary about the weapons and the methamphetamine, it was um, in the suburb of Pyongyang, a place where you never will bring Western people or foreign people at all. It was so old building, it was rotten, um, it was in the middle of the winter and on the street, um, it smelled really bad because the toilet water was running down the road um, and then we were asked to go down in a basement under one of those houses. And at that point, I literally feared because it was a dark way in. And I was literally fearing, you know, the sound of a pistol getting loaded and then lights out, I was dead. But I, I came to a big door, which I opened. And in the second I opened the door, there was a lot of light turning around, like a discotheque. And my first mind again was, they're gonna really torture us or doing some psychological thing on us and really make us feel bad. You must have been petrified. Totally. But then I walked a few meters ahead and there was this giant table filled up with all kind of food that you can have in, in Europe, like nearly going to a Michelin restaurant. And then we were told that the president of the arms factory and the president from the pharmaceutical industry will join us later for dinner and we could start the discussion. And the most bizarre thing, in, there's two, more, two bizarre things in that basement. First, during those negotiations and how we can do the things and getting hide away from the US, uh, you know, it's CIA, FBI, every intelligence. Um, then the president of the weapons industry, he just stand up, walk straight to a table and I was, but we're talking. Then he came back with a microphone and start singing karaoke. And I was like, okay, this is, now they've blown us, now they're just gonna play with us. But then he asked me to sing a song, and I, I'm, I'm not a good singer, I'm a really bad singer. And then um, I said, okay, I saw the, which song was in it, I saw some English song, and the Beatles, so I said, well, let's try one, because that's probably okay for me to sing. But the, the fun fact is that they put on Celine Dion with My Heart Will Go On. I can't sing that song at all. So Neither I refused. I. No. So I refused and I knew that 
that's a bad thing to refuse something as a guest in North Korea. So I need to think really fast what to do not to be, you know, rude. standing or rude. So I start singing a Danish children's song, which I used to sing for my daughters when they were small. And I thought, this is bad. But the thing is, after singing that song, the president from the Women's Forum came to me, put his hands on my chest and said, this song shows me how much you love your leader in your heart because it came straight from your heart. So I saved it by that children's song, which is really awkward to be in. Right. And then they handed us over all the papers. The uh, papers you're talking about, papers for this uh, illicit arms deal? Yeah, they gave us the manuals of the weapons program, the weapons they have for sale, how to operate, and the same with the medical, med medical industry. And we were literally just sitting with those papers thinking, this ain't gonna ha this is not true. We are dream we they won't give us those things. But they did, and they even, we even did a deal with them that we have to produce weapons in uh, Africa, in Uganda. We want to buy an island in Uganda to stay away from the government by bribing them, and then we could operate in, in peace. And all this was exposed in the documentary, yeah. The Mall, Undercover in North Korea. Uh, Ulrich, could you tell us a bit now about the events that took place after the release of your documentary? Did you not receive any threats to your life, or were you not scared of any North Korean retaliation? Were, you, were there any debriefing sessions with relevant authorities with regard to your work in North Korea? I've been talking with a lot of people, a lot of agencies, but first of all, when, when, it, when it was known to the world the documentary came out, um, it was like going from zero to a thousand overnight. Um, there was a lot of security issues with the Danish um, intelligence service. The first year I went out to do my speaking engagements, I, I needed a full bodyguard just within a few meters from me all the time. Um, our private home has changed, but a lot of security, changed the car, got a lot of um, instruction how to react if out in public, and I got felt threat. But the, I haven't got any threats from North Korea. I got a, a lot of messages on Instagram, Twitter, by, which I assume is the friends of Alejandro because I can check out the names that they look Spanish, and they call me the worst kind of things, but none have ever threatened me on life directly. Um, of course, I'm aware of that there could be a price on my head in North Korea for what I did. Um, and still thinking back in 2012, Kim Jong-un walked past me as a distance of you and me and looked me straight through the eyes for like a split second. Uh, if you do that today, I'm sure that's the last view of anything I'm going to see if I met him up. And, and, and staying with that, if you went back in time, Ulrich, would you, would you do the same thing over again, this undercover work in North Korea? Yeah. You would? I would because there is literally 25 million North Korean inhabitants suffering during that regime, which is terrible, terrible. And talking about the sufferings of the people in North Korea, what can you share with us about the actual lives of these people there? You were there in North Korea about 10 years ago. What did you observe? Well, in 2012, I, I could see the suffering of starvation, uh, the fear. And I was expecting going back in 2017 with, with Mr. James to see those people might got a better life, but it was actually worse um, because it still it was cold outside, minus 20 degrees at the time. Uh, people were still sitting on the street trying to find something. Not, you don't see that in the, in the regular Pyongyang as people are shown, which let's just call a showcase city, center Pyongyang. Um, but yeah, it's just sad to, to think of. Ulrich, was your family aware of your work in North Korea? Not at all. So they learnt about your work after the release of this documentary? Uh, I guess a few weeks before. What we... was their response? Oh, my wife was a bit disappointed. And, but then again, she also understand why I haven't told her. Because if I told her the truth, she would be, first of all, she would be very worried for me. The second, she wouldn't let me go. Or the third issue could be that if she went out with one of her friends to a cafe or something, she might could have said something that someone on the other table heard. Um, so, of course, she was disappointed and mad at me, and she didn't really knew what was going on at that time. But the day for the premiere, um, it was like all the pieces put together for her, and she was like, what have you done? Are you crazy? Are you normal? Are you even the man I'm married? You know, all those kind of questions. 
But but today, well, she she understand well why I did as I did, and both my wife and both my daughters are are proud of me. Right, good to know. All right, very briefly speaking, though, what do you hope ordinary viewers who watch, who have yet to watch your documentary, take away from it? First of all, that we need to help the North Korean people, and we need to stop the regime. And what is my really big concern now is that Putin and Kim Jong Un is going together. But on the one hand, what will happen? I think we will first see that within months because if Putin wants the weapons from Kim Jong Un, he will be weaker. So it's a balance. Um, but I literally hope that people that watch some more will will be more interested in putting focus on human rights in North Korea and how government people in North Korea are doing sanctions busting every right. day, every right, single hour, every second. Because you have raised greater light on that through this documentary. Ulrich, thank you so much for your time and your You're thoughts welcome. with us today. I'm happy to be here. Right, well, on that note, we end Monday's edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching and see you same time tomorrow. That is Tuesday.